I am so grateful for your presence here today. As we begin this 40-day journey together, we really do need each other. These series of lessons and sermons that we will be looking at over the course of the next 40 days are inspired by a book written by a man named Reuben Welsh, who wrote a book by the same title, We Really Do Need Each Other. It made such an impression upon me when I was going to that small school in upstate New York named Houghton College. My then future wife, Ella, and I read that as one of our first devotionals together, and we made a commitment together that we would, whatever happened, go together whatever this journey might put in front of us. And as Christians, we too are called to journey a life together in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so as we gather here today, I want you to think about all of those concerns, all of those troubles, all of those things that would distract you from being here today. And I want you to acknowledge those things, because some of us come today fixated on so many political things, political issues We're right in the midst of a political season, that where they're, all of our political candidates are trying to resolve uh, issues that have really no resolution. But we ignore those people that are sitting right in front of us. Let me use an illustration. When I was a younger pastor, and I came here at Holy Trinity 25 years ago, I was overwhelmed with the responsibilities of being a young pastor. I had so many things to do between visitation schedules, between sermons I had to write, <clears throat> between meetings I had to attend, between children's programmings and youth programmings and typing bulletins and making sure everything was set for Sundays. And I'll never forget, there was a girl by the name of Amanda. She was about an eight-year-old girl who started pounding on my door one day, three o'clock after she'd gotten out of school. I'd opened my door to my surprise. She was leaning on my railing, and there she introduced herself. Hi, I'm Amanda. And then she began to tell me, all of the tales and regal me with all of the things that happened to her that day in her school. It took about five minutes and then she looked at me and she smiled and waved and said, I'll see you tomorrow. And the next day she came back at three o'clock and the next day and the next day, well, I thought it was kind of cute, but listen, I had important pastor things to accomplish, didn't I? I had bulletins to type and meetings to attend to and agendas and topics and sermons to write. Now, I didn't want to come across as an unkind pastor. I was hoping eventually her interest in me would wane. But one day as she came for her five-minute visit, as she was leaving, she said, oh, by the way, I'll bring my friends tomorrow. Now, I said, no! Actually, that's probably exactly how I said it. But I said, you don't have to. And she replied, oh, that's okay. We'll come tomorrow and just keep you company. And sure enough, the next day, there she was with four of her friends, and they were sitting on my porch pounding on my door. But instead of five minutes listening to one young girl regal me with the tales of her day, I had each one of the kids want to tell me what happened at school that day. It took 25 minutes. Well, at the end of this, I'm getting a little bit impatient because, again, I've got important pastor stuff to take care of. You know, that bulletin doesn't type itself. Amanda looks at me and says, do you have anything to eat? Can we have a snack? Well, now you have to understand, I came from a very well-to-do community in Peters Township at Murray, PA. We didn't need to go and ask the neighbors for snacks. And I looked at her and said, you can go to your own house and get your own snacks. You don't need it from me. She said, oh, we don't have anything in our home. I said, sure, right. Well, again, I'm a young pastor. I don't want to appear to be rude. I will be rude, but I don't want to appear to be rude. So what I did is I went into my kitchen. I opened my refrigerator. I tried to rummage around. Oh, and I rummaged around all the good things that I thought the kids would like. And I reached my hand for a bag of carrots. I didn't know carrot kids loved carrots, but I grabbed it anyway. And I pulled out a pitcher of water. I'm sure I had some better things that the kids could have had to drink, but I gave them a warm pitcher of water. I didn't want to appear to be rude, but I definitely wanted to give them a message, please don't ask again. And so I gave them those carrots, and I gave them warm water, and they devoured every single carrot and drank every drop of water, and then they thanked me. They said, oh, 
We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> Trust me, they were day after day. I still have a relationship with many of those kids because as they walked away that day, something started formulating in my head. I started to realize that maybe the important thing that I had to do that day wasn't typing the bulletin or preparing myself for the next meeting or even spending an extra half an hour to uh, study and preparing for the lesson for Sunday. Maybe the very thing that I was supposed to do that day was spend that half an hour with those children. I had to refocus my vision, realizing that the busyness of a pastor was an excuse to occupy my life with things that really weren't all that important in comparison to those five children wanting to come and talk to me every single day and tell me the stories of their life. Maybe that was my real purpose in ministry. So my question for you today, have you ever been like me? Have you often been so concerned about the bigger issues that have to take place in life, those meetings you have to get to, the agenda that you've got to fulfill, the big political discussions that are going on, but you ignore the things that are right in front of you that are truly most important? You know, I mentioned to you that our series is inspired by a book written by a man who was a college professor in the 60s and 70s named Reuben Welsh. And again, he wrote that book, We Really Do Need Each Other. He was a professor of a Christian school in California. And his school administration, of course, they were going through a very tumultuous time in the 60s and 70s and all the protests and the peace protests. And their school felt like their Christian kids were kind of isolated in this little Christian community away from the real things that were taking place in life. And so the school administration sat down and created think tanks and discussion groups and, and all these things that they wanted to do to help the kids address the, the pressing issues of the day. And amidst this, Reuben wrote, one of our kids tried to commit suicide. He said, and there we were, faced with the real, real challenges of the day. You see, he said, it's not what's out there that's truly the pressing issues. It isn't the protests that are taking place. It's this one teenager who was filled with such despair that everybody missed it because they were focused on the big picture, and he tried to commit suicide. What was truly important? Let me read to you a quote from Reuben in his book. I believe, he says, that all the issues of life and death are present between you and me. Despair, loneliness, guilt, frustration, disillusionment, hate, bitterness, you name it. So let's not think about out there. Let's think about us and where we are and what God wants to say to us right now. You know, there's a phrase that we often hear. Sometimes we're so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. I'd like to amend that and use that in a different manner. Sometimes we're focused so much on the big picture that we forget about the people standing right in front of us. So I'm asking you a question today. Are you fixated on all the big picture items? Are you sitting out there putting on your blogs and your posts about all the big political issues and turmoils that are taking place today? Nobody really cares. Do you realize you're not making a difference in anybody's life? There is not one post, not one thing you've said on your Facebook page or any of your blog sites that have truly made a difference in the big political issues that need to take place in this world. You are just contributing to more noise. Why don't you really do something about the challenges and problems of life and look around you at the people who are needing your help today? That's the real issue. See, all those political things are just divisive distractions that take us away from what really needs to take place, the discussion about how we care for each other. So I'm asking you during this 40 days, during your small group time, I am asking you to ban all political discussion. This is not a suggestion. I am telling you, ban all discussion in your small groups about any of the political issues that are going on today because they are so 
unimportant compared to what is sitting right in front of you today. And what I mean by that are the people sitting around you in your group. Look at the faces of everybody around you. They are so much more important than any of the political issues that are being discussed and bannered about in our country and in our world. If you want to make an impact, this is where it starts. In our lesson for today, from the book of 1 John, we are told by this gospel writer, you know who 1 John, who John was. He was not, of course, John the Baptist. We often think of John the Baptist when we hear the name John, but there was another John, and actually he was a great man. He was one of the disciples of Jesus. In fact, we are told that he is the beloved disciple of Jesus, the one who Jesus loved. And here it is. He is also the very disciple that Jesus gave responsibility to for his mom after he died on a cross. How amazing is that? This is the only disciple of Jesus that lived to the ripe old age of 90. Every single other one was executed. So this one understood what it meant to live in community and live a long life. And he wanted to write to the Christians before he died and went to the church triumphant. And he wrote these words. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This is the one who is life itself, who is revealed to us. And we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is, who is eternal life. Not who brings eternal life. Isn't that interesting? Who is eternal life? He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you might have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son and Jesus Christ. We are writing these things that you may fully share our joy. That's an awesome lesson. It's an amazing story that is told by John that God saw the brokenness and the sin of this world and did something about it. Oh, you know what God didn't do? God didn't write another law. God decided not to create another agenda or legislate new regulations. God didn't shout from heaven, hey, I forgive you, go about your business. What God did is God spoke a word of love, and Jesus was born and gifted to us so that we might know and have a relationship with God. What God chose to do is to dwell amongst us in Jesus Christ. And it is in Jesus that God shows us the way to touch and transform the lives of those living amongst us. He looked into our eyes. He loved us where we were at. He wasn't focusing on some big picture and the big politics of the world. He was focusing on us. He looked us in the eyes and said, I'm going to transform you. That's how God transforms the big picture, not by passing rules, laws, and legislations, but by dwelling amongst us, living amongst us, transforming our lives. You are going to take the opportunity in your Bible study momentarily to read from the book of 1 John and study these words. And I'm hoping God touches your life so that you see what's truly important, not that big picture, the real big picture is what's sitting in front of you, the people that God has surrounded you with. How has God called you to transform your life and the lives of those around you, to touch them so that you might know the love of God? During the season, you are going to be encouraged to participate in these small group Bible studies once a week for about an hour, hour, 15 minutes. And we also are going to be handing out to you, your group leader will in just a moment, some devotionals that you are encouraged to read. Take 20 minutes every single day to devote yourself to time of Bible study and prayer. And we also encourage you, thirdly, to watch the sermons, the lessons that go with the themes of the week. And I'm asking that God to bless you on this 40-day journey. Let us pray. Holy Father, bless this small group that is ready to meet and discuss your holy word. 
Encourage them with the words that I have spoken, and most importantly, with the words that you want to speak to them through your, uh, for, through your faithful servant, John, that he might inspire them to deeper, bolder relationships with each other. For he asks this in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy your conversation. <laughs>